Devil May Cry 4 came out in 2008 for PS3, Xbox 360, and PC, making it the first game in the series that was multi-platform at launch. A mobile version known as Devil May Cry 4 Refrain came out in 2011 for iOS, yeah, news to me too, and the original game got a special edition in 2015 for the next generation of consoles, so that's PS4, Xbox One, and they made a PC version of that too. The special edition had the usual you'd come to expect, remastered visuals, some difficulty adjustments, and the added bonus of playing the game again as Virgil, Lady, or Trish. The game takes place after Devil May Cry 2, which, fun fact, apparently DMC2 was supposed to be the furthest game in the timeline before 5, but then they changed it to make it so that 4 takes place after 2, which I don't mind at all. 2 is isolated enough that it could have just taken place whenever, and the retcon kind of makes it easier to understand, since it means the chronological order of the games would just be 3, 1, 2, 4, 5, with the reboot being its own thing, which leaves little room for confusion. You just go in the numbered order while keeping in mind that 3 is a prequel. Simple. Oh, uh, right, the actual setting, not the timeline. So like I said, it takes place after 2 on an island called Fortuna, and within Fortuna is the Order of the Sword, a religious cult that worships Sparta, Dante and Virgil's father. While the overall execution was a bit iffy, I do like the overall religious light-presenting theme that they tried to go with in this one, because it helps to showcase some of the more underreported consequences of Sparta saving the mortal world from the demons, like making an entire religion based off of him. Anyway, the game opens up with the group's leader, Sanctus, giving what appears to be a sermon. There's a new main character, Nero, who was adopted and raised in the faith, and on this particular day, he's late. And even when he gets there, he doesn't seem all too interested in what's being said. Oh, uh, by the way, he's Virgil's son. The game kind of expects you to just figure it out, but like, come on, it's the worst kept secret when talking about the games. Um, that's like making spoilers for Anakin being Darth Vader. Uh, you probably already knew before clicking on the video. Uh, anyway, as everyone's listening to the old man go on and on about Sparta, Dante shows up and pops a cap right between the dude's eyes, killing him. For now, at least. After teaching Nero how to play, Dante slips away and Credo, the general of the Order's Holy Knights, orders Nero to try and track down Dante, as well as killing off any demons that slip out of these structures called Hellgates, because that's been a problem lately too. Credo also has a sister named Kyrie, and if you forget that she exists after finishing this video, you'd be forgiven for doing so because… <laughs> shit man. Princess Peach, Kyrie, Menphilia from Final Fantasy XIV, all of these quote-unquote useless characters, I owe all of them an apology. Because Kyrie right here is the epitome of damsel in distress. Gameplay-wise, Nero plays very differently from Dante. He has one gun, Blue Rose, a sword called Red Queen, but Red Queen has a gimmick to it. The hilt works like a motorcycle handle and you can rev the blade up to make your next hit stronger. Or preferably, you'll get free cartridges if you press the trigger button as you land hits. Nero can actually be pretty formidable if you manage to master this, but unfortunately, I was not that guy. I was pretty terrible with Nero, and I couldn't quite get the timing on that X-Seed ability right. He only has one style, which is his Devilbringer, the scaly-looking right arm he's got. He can use it to grab enemies from afar, grapple around, and prolong combos during fights. This is pretty much all you'll have to work with for his segment of the game. Although, they say that there was somewhat of a push to make Devil May Cry 4 a bit more approachable for newcomers, so from that angle, I guess this makes sense as it's a good way to ease someone new into the combat system. As you're playing through Nero's section of the game, it's revealed that Sanctus is alive after all, or rather, he was brought back using a ritual. It's also revealed that he's the one who set up the hell gates around the area to let demons out on purpose. I guess this was to keep his members anxious and afraid, which, to be fair, is a very common thing that cults do, so props to him for playing by the book, I guess. Nero soon discovers a lab and the Order's lead scientist, Agnes, who plans to kill Nero because the lab was supposed to be a secret, and Agnes already heavily disliked him anyway for his obvious lack of enthusiasm for their cause. Agnes was experimenting with demons using their DNA, or whatever the demon's equivalent of DNA is, at least, to create certain weaponry. This includes the Angelo Knights that Nero encountered thus far, as well as angelic forms for some of the higher-ranking members of the Order, including Agnes himself. This is also where they were keeping Virgil's sword Yamato, which almost on instinct gravitates towards Nero and unlocks his Devil Trigger. Though unlike Dante and Virgil, instead of transforming Nero himself, a spectral, oriental-looking demon hovers above his shoulders. What? The whole JoJo thing was too easy.
Nero runs into Credo a little later, who had been sent to kill Nero now that he knew about the Order's secret. Credo also has an angelic form, but their fight is interrupted when Agnes captures Kyrie to use her in the next step of the Order's plan, which Credo himself isn't on board with either since Sanctus promised up and down that he'd never use Kyrie in any of his crazy-ass rituals only for him to turn around and decide to use her anyway. Nero chases the Order for another few missions, and it turns out that they were going to use Kyrie as one of the components to power the giant statue that they've called the Savior. But the thing is, they anticipated that Nero was going to follow them, so Kyrie's other purpose was to serve as bait – see, even the other characters know that that's all she's good for – because what they also need to be able to complete the Savior was a descendant of Sparta. They were originally trying to get a hold of Dante, but Nero apparently fits the bill too, in case it was already obvious enough that Nero's related to him and Virgil. The Order's true plan is to use the Savior to destroy the Hellgates and all the demons that came out of them, even though it's the Order that created this problem in the first place, but you know, you create the problem, you solve it yourself, and then everyone thinks you're a hero, and you've got their devotion locked in for damn near forever. At first, I questioned why this was even necessary since it seems like the Order already had so much dominion over their members and Fortuna was such a small area, it would probably be pretty easy to stamp out any dissent amongst the citizens, but maybe it was needed more so for any outsiders that might have discovered the island and tried to dismantle the cult, like Dante and his friends. It's possible it could have been that and maybe the whole creating the Hellgates on purpose was just to set up a doctrinal reason as to why they're going to be worshipping a giant animated statue now. Or maybe Sanctus just got bored. Maybe it was like, you know what, I'm already pretty old, I've got a pretty good racket going, let me stir up some drama just for shits and giggles. Who knows. Actually, I think the story would be a lot more interesting if that last part was actually why he straight up did it, but... Anyway, doesn't matter, Credo's back, and he's gone. Okay, so we're approaching the midpoint. Uh, Nero gets captured and absorbed into the Savior. A little later, Sanctus gives Agnes Yamato to go open the final true Hellgate beneath Fortuna's main city, which causes demons to just start pouring out everywhere. And with all of that being said, I think we've come upon Devil May Cry 4's biggest flaw, and that's just how repetitive it is. And this really does become apparent after Sanctus captures Nero, and then you have to shift over to Dante's section of the campaign. You'll be playing as him for the second half of the game. He has the most robust toolkit out of all the playable characters, he's got most of his sword combos from 3, and you can switch his styles out instantly with the D-pad, something that was carried over into the Switch version of DMC3, but would have been introduced as a new mechanic in this game. And we haven't even gotten into the three extra weapons you pick up later. However, you don't really get enough time to become familiar with all of this stuff because Dante's segment is just you backtracking through the previous areas. And I mean that as plainly as I can put it. 1 and 3 had you doing this too, but usually there were significant changes. In DMC1, you were able to use your updated resources to access newer areas within those old areas, and in 3, the tower got smashed up after Arkham opened the gate to the underworld, so some previous areas ended up merging together, or chunks of rubble and debris might have closed off previously accessible areas, forcing the game to give you an alternative route to the, your destination. In 4, however, it's literally just the same places, but backward, with very few of the aforementioned changes. You even fight the same bosses again, the only exception being Credo because, you know, he's already dead. The only difference this time is that you're playing as Dante instead, which, by the way, let's touch on that for a minute. Getting control of Dante is going to be the first time in the game where you'll be playing as someone besides Nero, and it quickly becomes apparent that most of the enemies were designed for Nero and his Devilbringer abilities. It's still doable as Dante, as a matter of fact, aside from a few really annoying enemies, I'd say it's easier as Dante in my opinion, but that's less so because the enemies were designed for him and more so because Dante is so damn strong now that you can just brute force your way through most encounters. I'd say the most annoying enemies for me were the Chimeras, those plant hybrid things that could combine with the puppets. I hated how they could still passively swing their tentacles at you even when they were staggered and just cancel your style ranking just because. Uh, the cutlasses, the shark looking demons were also pretty annoying, specifically as Dante since he can't really touch them while they're below ground, so you'd have to spam your guns to try and approach them. And as I said, you don't have Nero's Devilbringer to just pluck them out either. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, the Blitz. Your melee attacks don't work on them while they're charged, you have to spam your guns to blow the electricity off of them, then you get to hit them normally, but if you don't kill them before they put the lightning back up, 
and you probably won't because they have a lot of HP, they'll charge red instead of yellow and start zipping around again, which by the way, they're very hard to lock onto when they're doing this, so that makes it hard to keep track of them. And then also during this red phase, you're avoiding these dudes like they're contagious or some shit because if they catch you, they self-destruct and take half your health bar with them, so yeah, fuck them too. Another gripe I have with the game, not as significant, but it still bothers me. The extra Devil Arms you get are not directly based off of the bosses you defeat. Granted, Devil May Cry 1 wasn't like this either, but it was also the first game, so once again, I'll kinda let that slide. 3, however, had weapons, styles, or guns directly based off of the bosses. For example, the Nunchucks from Cerberus, or the Quicksilver style from Gurion, or Lady loading Dante her rocket launcher after you defeat her near the end of the game. None of the extra Devil Arms in 4 are like this. Beating Echidna gives you a weapon called Gilgamesh, which is 4's version of the Gauntlets. Beating Bael gives you Pandora, a new ranged weapon, or rather a collection of ranged weapons. And beating Burial gives you Lucifer, which is a contraption that Dante wears on his back and it allows him to spawn these uh, spikes everywhere. It also has an indefinite combo, which can be useful for prolonging your style ranking, but as you probably noticed, they're all unrelated to the bosses. It makes me wonder if they actually planned for three bosses named Gilgamesh, Pandora, and Lucifer for Dante's segment of the game, scrapped it, but then maybe they had the corresponding weapons already designed and were like, you know what, just throw them in. I don't know, just a thought. The only boss in Dante's route that breaks this rule is the second fight with Agnes, or third if you count the glass chamber as fight number one, but Dante beats him and that's how he gets Yamato back making this, once again, the only boss in his route where the item is relevant because Agnes is the one who, you know, took Yamato from Sanctus and used it to fully open up the Hellgate near Fortuna. Dante does have one unique boss for his route, however, and that's the fight against the Savior. Unfortunately, it's pretty bad. Or maybe it's just a skill issue on my part, but it takes a while to bring him down, mostly because the game is kind of vague on what you actually have to do. But essentially, you have to shatter each of the blue jewels located on the statue's body. Once you take care of all the ones on the arms and legs, it'll shift over to a second phase where you can target the one on the chest, which itself is kind of difficult. You can use Pandora's Revenge Laser to speed up the process since it's got really good range, uh, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, I didn't pick up on this until I played the game again as Trish. Dante then drives Yamato into the Savior's body, Nero retrieves it from the inside, and then heads deep within to finish things. So you remember how you had to fight most everyone again as Dante? <laughs> well, guess what? You'll be doing it again for the third time. Everyone except for Credo, because I guess his fight was too goaded for a second run. But after Nero runs through all the bosses again, he makes it to the Savior's core, beats the shit out of Sanctus, retrieves Kyrie and Sparta, because Sanctus apparently had that too, I guess? I know Trish was working for the Order undercover in a disguise and all, but still, I don't recall her ever giving him the sword. Ah, whatever. Roll with it. The Savior requests a rematch, so Nero has to remind the little fucker that the game is over and the game actually does end. Like I said, I do like where they were trying to go with the story, and overall, it was still alright, but you could tell they were a bit strapped for time at the halfway mark, and then Mission 12 onwards was just to pad the game out. Speaking of padding, we're technically not done, because this is the special edition we're talking about. The good news is you can run through the campaign again as Virgil, Lady, and Trish. The bad news is... You'll be running through the campaign again, backtracking and all. Virgil is playable for all 20 missions, there's no midpoint switching with him, while Lady and Trish share their campaign just like Nero and Dante did. Lady is playable during Nero's segments, and Trish is playable during Dante's. Bear in mind, none of the gameplay in any of the alternate campaigns is canon. You get like a minute's worth of extra cutscenes for each character, but the gameplay itself, as I said, isn't canon. Which makes sense because 1. Virgil's supposed to be dead by now, and 2. Why would Lady be fighting Dante inside of Sanctus's bedroom and winning at that. Anyway, let's start with Virgil. He has all of his weapons from 3, his sword Yamato, the Beowulf Gauntlets, and Sparta. The newest thing about him is his concentration meter, so during battle, if you stand still without getting hit, dodge attacks, or land hits yourself, you'll build up his concentration meter. At max concentration, all of his attacks will get a buff. His sword attacks will hit harder, Beowulf moves get an extra charge, and most importantly, it unlocks a new move while he's in Devil Trigger called Judgment Cut End, which is basically a free screen wipe. The only enemies that survive this move are bosses, and even then, it still takes off a nice chunk of their HP. Gameplay-wise, I feel comfortable saying Virgil is the most powerful out of all the playable characters, and I didn't really mind 
because it kind of made up for my uh, chronic skill issue. Lady is probably the most awkward character to use because she only has the bare minimum for melee and mostly relies on using her guns. Since she's also the only playable character who's completely human, her devil trigger, I'm using air quotes there, isn't a buff, it's just a super attack where she throws out a bunch of explosives in a circle around her. Although to be fair, they do do decent damage, and just like everyone else's Devil Trigger, you can still use it to cancel enemy grabs if you find yourself in a pinch. Don't let her limitations fool you though. Yes, she has very little melee options and a one-trick pony Devil Trigger, but she's probably the second most broken character in the game. For melee, she can do a couple combos by using the bayonet portion of Kalina Ann, her rocket launcher. For guns, she has... Kalina Ann, obviously, her two handguns, and a shotgun. She's sort of in a permanent gunslinger where the B button gives you access to unique moves for each gun. Using it without any directional input lets her use Kalina Ann to grapple enemies and swing across gaps, so basically it's her own variation of the Devilbringer. The directional B input with the handguns is fairly quick and does decent damage, so that was my go-to for smaller enemies. And just like with Nero and Dante's guns, each of her normal shots can be charged three times. But, but fuck the other two guns, let's address the elephant in the room. Kalina Ann, charge shot level 3. Granted, it takes a while to get there, but holy shit does this thing do stupid amounts of damage. The only reason I put Judgment Cut End above it is because after a few seconds, Virgil does become invincible, and even if he didn't, your character is harder to stagger in Devil Trigger anyway. Lady can be knocked out of Kalina and level 3, which makes this move less useful against rank and file enemies. Against bosses though, if you sit back and charge that thing while they're stunned or they're changing phases, it's GG. This thing will melt through them faster than Judgment Cut End, and it actually trivialized a lot of the bosses that gave me trouble when playing as someone else. I distinctly remember on my third fight with Echidna, I beat her in like two charged shots. If I don't get an opportunity now, I'll probably put it on the tail end of the video as footage when I'm concluding. And the two Sanctus fights? Cakewalk. During the final boss in particular, he didn't even get a chance to use his fancy, you know, behold the power of the sword attack or whatever where he grabs Sparta and it glows red and he just charges at you. Like, that's how fast I killed him. He didn't even get a chance to use that. Forget Dante, forget Virgil, forget the Legend of Sparta, forget all of that. This shit right here is what'll make devils cry. <laughs> Okay, on to Trish. She's not as broken as Virgil or Lady, but she's still pretty powerful. She has her hand-to-hand -hand electric attacks mapped to the Y button, or triangle, if you're on PlayStation, and her sword attacks with Sparta are on the B button. She has a pair of handguns like Dante, and you can use directional inputs to access a few of Pandora's forms too. So she's basically a slightly simplified Dante with a few new moves mixed in. I think the most notable thing about Trish is the fact that her round trip, where she takes her sword and hurls it forward, it actually lingers on the enemies. So you can use this to stun unlock enemies and combo them uninterrupted. Or you can throw the sword out and distract one group of enemies while you use your fist combo to take care of another. And then you can call it back at any time by pressing B again. So yeah, Trish was pretty fun to play as too, and I will say, it's a good thing Bloody Palace exists, because by the time you play the campaign as everyone, you'll have explored all of Devil May Cry 4's areas a grand total of six times. At least. Probably more if you opt to play on higher difficulties. Fucking hell, I do not want to see Fortuna again for as long as I live. But since I briefly mentioned Bloody Palace, let's get into that. It functions mostly the same way it did in 3, a tournament mode that allows you to fight groups of enemies and climb floors, with the occasional boss thrown in every several fights or so. On one hand, it's nice to be able to play as everyone without having to play the story over and over again. On another, the one thing they did to force Bloody Palace was add a timer, and this really drags down the experience because it really limits your options with regards to practicing combos for different characters. I understand that killing enemies quickly is still relevant since you're graded on time during missions as well, but like seriously, two minutes? To soften the blow, you do get extra time when you kill enemies, and you get even more time if you clear the stage without taking damage, but I'm just thinking if they really wanted to go this route, I would have liked a third game mood that gave you a punching bag or some equivalent so you could practice. So to conclude, despite all the bitching, I still think Devil May Cry 4 is a great game and definitely worth your time. Yes, there are quite a few things it did that I really hope they don't carry over to the next games, like the blatant backtracking, the forgettable bosses, Credo excluded, the 
Proud Souls currency, which I didn't mention this before, but that is how you unlock new moves in the game. Although I think it was more trouble than it was worth, and I'd really prefer if they'd have just had red orbs stay as the soul currency from here on out. However, its highs are also very high. They introduced a new protagonist, and Dante became the sort of wise old mentor, and I actually think that's kind of sweet. I like when you have a long-running series and you get to see the characters age and develop along with you. Probably explains my Trails addiction, but you know. Visually, the game is stunning, especially for an early 7th gen game. It's really good looking and still holds up even today. The music's awesome. Even Devil May Cry 2 had good music, and you already know how I feel about that game, but 4 is no exception in that department. Nero's battle theme might even be one of the best songs in the series so far. It also has the largest roster of playable characters so far. Pretty much every major character introduced in the series so far is playable, and they all have distinct playstyles, so you're bound to find a favorite. And that's the end of it. I'm probably going to finish the reboot soon, but it might be a while before I cover it since there's some other stuff I want to cover first. But for now, that will be the end of this video. So leave a like if you enjoyed it, sub to the channel if you haven't already. Also, a special thanks to all channel members for your continued support. I see you, and I appreciate you more than you know. I will see you all again very soon.